Um, so let's just talk through these problems. So here's a couple sequences. And often when we are for, faced with a sequence, we are asked to find a formula for the nth term of the sequence. Um, so typically the things I look for when I'm trying to look for a formula is I look for maybe to see if it looks like the, if I write it as a fraction, like the numerator and the denominator kind of separately. Like the second one actually kind of corresponds to more. The second one I can kind of see the numerator and the denominator kind of each doing their own thing. And I can kind of see pattern for each of those. Let's actually look at that one first. So if I look at the numerator, actually let's look at the denominator. I can see the denominator. I have a three to the first and then a three to the second and then a three to the third and then a three to the fourth. So it looks like my denominator is going to be a three to the nth power, right? Because right, that's my a sub one, a sub two, et cetera, et cetera. Now for my numerator, and again, so I would say everything else being equal, if I see something alternating, I'm just gonna worry about that at the end, right? I see negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, or positive, whatever. I know it, I'm having negative one to the n or to the n plus one. And I'm just gonna wait and deal with that at the very end. So I have a one and then the square root of two and then the square root of three. And then that two is a little bit misleading. What's a better way to write that so I can see what's actually happening here? Right. And I can also see that this is really the square root of one. So then when I see that, oh, the first term has the square root of one, the second term has the square root of two, third square root of three, it looks like the nth term is gonna have the square root of n. And then lastly, I need a negative one to the, I just need to make sure the first term's right. So if it's negative one to the n, negative one to the first will give me a negative, which will work out. So I want a negative one to the n, to the n. I will also mention because sometimes people combine it, if I have a negative one to the n and a three to the n, I can write that as one fraction. I could write this as a sub n equal to negative one third to the n times the square root of n, if you wanted to. Okay, let's look at the other one over here. So here, I don't really see anything like that. I don't see... Like it kind of looks like, well, if I if I wrote out the next term, it looks like I might get a 27, a 27 in the bottom. Like I've got a three, but but like hmm, that seems there isn't like the same kind of pattern over here. Um, if we look for differences, six minus two is four, four minus oh, that doesn't seem good either. So one thing to look for that I don't know how else to really say it other than just kind of like to say it is sometimes it makes sense to look for if each subsequent term is the same multiple of the previous term. So you could ask yourself, what do you multiply by six to get four? Or in other words, what's four divided by six? What is eight thirds divided by four? It's two thirds. What is 16 ninths divided by eight thirds? Well, let's check. It's 16 ninths times three eighths, but yeah, that's going to be two thirds. So what we see here is an example of what's called a geometric sequence, where each subsequent term is multiplied by the same ratio of the previous term. So I could say, oh, it looks like every time I'm going to multiply by two thirds. So this first term, well, actually what I should really say is, I'm thinking of my nth term as being some number times two-thirds to the n. I have to figure out what that number is. I'm starting with this. So if I'm starting, and again, this is kind of, I can make, so here's a way to make it easy. I could say, I'm just going to pick that number and say my a sub n is going to be six times two-thirds to the n with the caveat that n is starting at zero. That is a totally valid way to answer this question. But if we wanted to start at n equal to one, we have to change things around a little bit. We need another, we need to kind of get rid of a factor of two to the third of two thirds. So we could also do it as a sub n equals. How would I really do this if I was trying to do it? I would probably do it like this. I'd probably write it as six times two thirds to the n minus one. And then n is starting at one. I don't love that. It's kind of funky, but it works. If you think about it, let's see. So I always like to check if I plug in n equals one, 
I get m one minus one, which is zero. Two thirds to the zero is one, and six plus one is six. And if I plug in n equals two, two thirds to the two minus one is just two thirds, and six times two thirds gives me four. And every time n gets one bigger, I'm just going to multiply by another two thirds. So this would totally work. Um, if you want to write this in kind of a more typical way, what we're really doing here is we're saying I've got six times two thirds the n minus one, which is really six times two thirds to the n times two thirds to the negative one, which is really six times three halves times two thirds to the n, which is really 18 over two, which is nine times two thirds to the n. So you write it that way with n starting at one. And that's probably the more usual way people would imagine writing this, but any of these answers are correct. This answer is correct, this answer is correct, this answer is correct. And literally, you could find an infinite number of ways of actually writing an answer to this question, right? I could do something stupid, like say, well, I'm gonna start at n equals three. So I could say my a sub n is gonna be six times two thirds to the n minus three, starting at three. That would also be a valid answer to a formula for this sequence. And you can really start anywhere. Usually we try to start at n equals zero or n equals one, but that's just because it's a convention that makes, makes it easy for us usually. There's no reason you couldn't start at three. Questions, comments, concerns? Um, let's see. And I suppose we could ask for each of these, eh, that's a fair question. So does our sequence converge? So does, let's use the, the typical one, the, this one here. Does a sub n equal to nine times two thirds to the n converge or diverge? And just like last time, to see if a sequence converges or diverges, you're really just asking, does the limit to infinity exist? So really this question just means, does the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n exist, meaning convergence, or not, meaning divergence. Well, let's find it. Let's see if we can do it. So let's say the limit as n goes to infinity of, now here's a way to write this that makes it less obvious what's happening. If I wrote it as nine times two to the n over three to the n, instead of two thirds to the n, two to the n is going to infinity. Three to the n is going to infinity. And I will also point out, L'Hopital's rule doesn't actually help us here. You could apply L'Hopital's rule many, many, many times and still, well, in fact, let, I'll do it one time. If we did L'Hopital's rule, we get the limit as n goes to infinity of nine times, the derivative of two to the n is two to the n times the natural log of two. The derivative of three to the n is three to the n times the natural log of three. It's still an infinity over infinity type. So here we have to kind of just use common sense. So if I rewrite this the other way, the limit as n goes to infinity of nine times two thirds to the n, as n gets larger and larger, two thirds times two thirds times two thirds times two thirds, is that gonna get bigger or smaller? Smaller, because we're multiplying by a number that's less than one. So this limit is going to be zero because the thing we're multiplying by is just making it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And, smaller. and generally something that's true, for a geometric sequence, and that's just a sequence where each next term is the previous term multiplied by the same ratio every time. So we typically write a geometric sequence as something like a sub n equal to a times r to the n, where r is the ratio and a is just like essentially the starting term. Um, it converges if that ratio is between, hmm, let me make sure I say this the right way. Technically an equal one. It converges if r is less than or equal to one or bigger than negative one. Essentially if it's small, right? Because if you keep multiplying by a number that's less than one or, or you know, 
close to zero. It could be like negative two thirds or negative three fourths. Or you're just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Maybe you're going to alternate signs if it's negative, but it's still going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Technically, one is okay too, because if R was one, it would just be some boring thing. Like, really, like, right, if R is one, your sequence is A sub N equal to A, which is just the sequence A, 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 which converges to A. Boringly, but converges to A. Um, and it diverges otherwise. So it diverges otherwise. So this one in the future will just be like, oh yeah, it converges because your R value, which is the thing that's being raised to the nth power, is a number that's between negative one and one. Cool? Question? Okay. So another example of this. So I should actually let's go back to the other one we were looking at. So just as a point of kind of difference, I will also mention that the other example we had which was we had a sub n equal to negative one third to the n times the square root of n. This is definitely not geometric. Specifically that square root of n is screwing things up. But if we look back at our, at our terms, right? Our terms were negative one third, positive square root of two over nine, negative square root of three over 27, positive square root of four over 81. There isn't any one ratio that you can multiply this times that, right? There's nothing that, right? There's nothing that you can keep multiplying by to get to the next one. So this is not, right? So to get from here to here, I'd have to multiply by, let's see, negative root two over three. And to get from here to here, I'd have to multiply by um, negative root three over root two over three. And to get from here to here, I'd have to multiply by negative two over root three over three, right? It's just, it's not the same. So if you're multiplying by different things each time to get to the next thing, not that you're always thinking of it that way, but that's one way to think of it. Um, it's not geometric because your ratio is not constant. Does that said, we can still think about what's going to happen to the, um, let me ask this word I'm looking for. Oh, about the converge or divergence. So does the sequence converge or diverge? Let's find out. We're going to take the limit as n goes to infinity of negative one third to the n times the square root of n. Now, something I said last time, which I'll repeat again, if you have an alternating sequence, the only thing it can converge to is zero if it converges. Otherwise, it's going to diverge. So usually what we do is we look at the non-alternating part and see if it's convergent to zero or not. So let's look at, so we're going to examine the limit as n goes to infinity of just the square root of n over three to the n. Okay, so what does common sense tell us? Does this thing converge to zero or not? Good question. What's getting bigger faster? The top or the bottom? The bottom, right? Three to the n is an exponential thing. And that's way bigger than a square root thing. Um, we could probably use L'Hopital's rule. I don't know how big, like, has Varn talked about L'Hopital's rule much in this context? But you guys did learn it in 16b or 16a? They, if, I Okay, but you didn't? Okay, so it's probably not going to come up very much, if at all. I don't know what his expectation is. But just, so just in case, just to kind of clarify, L'Hopital's rule is a way of evaluating, um, uh, oh my gosh, what is Indeterminate limits, meaning when you have an infinity over infinity or zero over zero. So I plugged in infinity for n here. We'd have square root of infinity over three to infinity, which is an infinity over infinity type. So if you have an infinity over infinity type, what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to take, using L'Hopital's rule, the limit as n goes to infinity of the derivative of the top function over the derivative of the bottom function. And if that limit exists, then it's equal to the limit of the previous thing. So if we do that, the derivative of n to the one half is one half n to the negative one half. 
And the derivative of three to the n is three to the n times the natural log of three. If we re-express this, the end of the negative one half can come down to the denominator's end of the positive one half. So I can write this as the limit as n goes to infinity of one over two times n to the one half times three to the n times the natural log of three. And now the denominator is getting infinitely large and the numerator is just one. So you have one divided by a really big number, which is going to zero, which means this limit is also zero. And again, that makes some amount of sense, right? Because the denominator is way, way bigger than the numerator. So it makes sense that this fraction is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Also, if you look at the terms of our sequence, oh yeah, it looks like this thing is getting smaller, right? The next term is going to be square root of five over three to the fifth. And the next one's going to be the square root of six over three to the sixth, right? The bottom is getting gigantic and the, and the top is barely getting bigger at all. I mean, it's getting bigger, but very, very slowly. So that's kind of the idea of what's going on there. Um, Cause he started talking about series yet. Yeah, okay. So hmm, I don't really know how he talked about series. That's a good question. How do I want to talk about series? So a series, I guess we should talk about it in this case, like geometric series first, because those are kind of the first entree into series. Well, I'm really all over the place here. So let's talk about series, specifically geometric series. So series also known as sums. For whatever reason, sometimes I say the wrong thing when I'm saying sequence or series, I will accidentally say sequence. I mean, I will try my best not to, but just as a warning, like if you think I'm saying the wrong thing, feel free to check me and be like, hey, James, did you mean the other thing? I'll be like, yeah. Usually I catch myself right away, but occasionally it's just the wrong word sticks out. So let's look at the following sequence first. So the sequence, um, let's look at a sub n equal to, so I want to do the boring example, and let's see, yeah, fine, let's do the boring example, one over two to the n, where n is greater than or equal to one. Um, I should point out, you can write the sequence as one over two to the n, or you can write it as one half to the n. It's the same thing, because one to any power is just one, so often we'll write it like this, often we'll write it like this. Um, in any event, the sequence is geometric, right? Each subsequent term is just the previous term multiplied by one half. So if we start writing out terms, terms are gonna look like one half, one fourth, one eighth. I stop, I stop, you just stop simplifying. So I just write, sorry, one over two to the fourth, one over two to the fifth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my ratio r is equal to one half. That's just the amount we're multiplying each term by to get to the next term. Um, so the series for this geometric sequence or also called the geometric series is the sum of these terms. Now, how detailed do we want to get? Yeah, let's get fairly detailed. So here's what we actually really do. We're going to create a new sequence and it's called the sequence of partial sums. So we're going to create the sequence of partial sums. So the first partial, and so let's be very specific with our notation here. These terms, right? That term is A1, that term is A2, A3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm gonna need more room. So to create the sequence of partial sums, we're just gonna start at the beginning. Our first partial sum is kind of boring. It's literally just the first term, which is gonna be one half. Our second partial sum is the second term, or sorry, it's the, it's the FOB, oh my gosh, it's the sum of the first two terms, that's what we call it a partial sum, which is going to be one half plus one fourth. And as you can see, it goes on, right? The third partial sum is 
A1 plus A2 plus A3, which is one half plus one fourth plus one eighth. We tend to start getting tired of writing out like all of these terms. So what we do is we start using sigma notation. So I'm gonna write my fourth partial sum instead of as A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4, I'm gonna write it as the sum from I equals one to four of A sub I which is going to be one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth. And it goes on. And typically what we do is we then write the nth partial sum. Most people use it, use, use the capital N when they do this, but if you did something different in class, you should let me know. Like I'm going to write it as S sub capital N, which is fairly standard, but he might have written lowercase n. It doesn't really matter. But... Did he do this at all? Because you talked about partial sums. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. It's really, it really, I mean, I mean, it kind of, I'm just asking if he's using a capital N here or a lowercase n. For the, for the, for the nth partial sum. Okay. So I can use lowercase too. I can be, I can be a team player. Okay. Right, like capital gamma. So this is just the sum from I equals one to N of A sub I, which is just one over two to the first plus one over two to the second plus. Okay, fine, we can switch it to K. Plus all the way to one over two to the N. So the idea is we would love to know if this new sequence converges or not. So does the sequence of partial sums which is S1 comma S2 comma S3 comma S4 comma all the way to SN et cetera, et cetera. Does this converge or diverge? And so depending on, so that's kind of the, that's kind of the big question for the rest of this section about sequences and sums. We're going to look at various sums or series and ask, do those series converge or diverge? And we're going to develop a few different tests, you know, the ratio test, the root test, a few other tests to help us determine if a thing converges or diverges. Most series that we look at, we will be able to tell if they converge or diverge but we won't usually be able to tell what they converge to. So a sequence, which we were just talking about, where it's just a list of numbers, we can totally usually find what they converge to, right? They converge to zero or five or whatever. But for a series where we're taking a sequence of partial sums and asking what those add up to essentially, we can't always tell what number they add up to, even if we know they add up to some finite number. Um, what else I want to say here before we, before we get back into this? Um, oh, this is why on Friday, no, sorry, Friday, why I'm the last, on um, Wednesday, I said really everything we're going to do is sequences because even though we're talking about series, a series is just a sequence. We're going to call it a series most of the time, but it's good to remember the fact we have that this series, this sum is really just one in a list of a sequence of partial sums. Okay, so now the question, does this converge or diverge? Well, for these geometric series, we can, if they converge, find what they converge to. It's a really kind of neat pattern. Um, if we look at this here, if I add one half plus one fourth, that's really two fourths plus one fourth, which is three fourths. And if I, and I imagine he showed you this one. It's usually kind of the standard first example. This is going to be three fourths plus one eighth, which is six eighths plus one eighth, which is seven eighths. And you might guess the next one's going to be 15 sixteenths. So essentially, each next partial sum is just whatever the biggest power is on the bottom. So, right, you're two squared, two to the third, two to the fourth, or down here, two to the n. And then the term on top is just one less than that. Or if you prefer, if you do the division, two to the n divided by two to the n is one, and one over two to the n is one over two to the n. 
So this is this is what we're doing is we're essentially finding the formula for the nth term of the sequence of partial sums. And the idea is if you want to know if this converges or not, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking the you're going to find the sum is going to be the sum from k equals one to infinity of one over two to the k. And what we're actually doing when we do this, even though we don't always write it out, is we're thinking of this as the limit as n goes to infinity of your sequence of partial sums. Or in other words, the limit as n goes to infinity of your sum from k equals one to n of one over two to the k. Whatever way you want to think about it, and I know I've written it like four different ways here. The idea is that if you can find a formula for this, which we did, then we can take the limit of that. So we're going to get the limit as n goes to infinity of one minus one over two to the n. And then we know that one over two to the n is going to go to zero. And we're just going to get one. So when we add this up, one half plus one fourth plus one eighth plus one sixteenth, and so on, so on, so on. If you do that forever, you get closer and closer and closer to the number one. So we do say that the infinite sum is one, with the knowledge that we're actually right. You can't actually add this up forever, but if you were able to, you would eventually get close as close to one as you wanted to. Right? It's kind of like saying. It's kind of like saying, well, it's exactly like saying the limit as n goes to infinity of, I don't know, n squared over n squared plus two is equal to one. You never actually get to one, but you can get as close to one as you want. So when we say this limit is equal to one, what we're saying is this function is getting really, really close to one. When we say that this sum is equal to one, even though we're going to say it adds up to one, what we really are saying in the back of our mind is, oh, well, it's really just getting super duper close to one. But we're just going to say it adds up to one. Okay, so for geometric series, there's kind of this pattern that always works. So for a geometric series, which generally looks like this. So we write it as the sum from for I should say I should say for an infinite geometric series, the sum from k equals do I want to start at zero or one? Is he starting at zero or one? Okay, k equals one to infinity of typically written as some a times r to the k. This converges. If your R, your ratio is strictly between one and negative one. Some people prefer to write this as the absolute value of your ratio is less than one. And converges to, so I'm gonna write a formula and then I'm gonna, we're gonna talk more about it. So if this is the way it's written, then we're going to say it converges to sum from k equals one to infinity of a times r to the k is equal to a times r over one minus r. But I don't love this formula. I mean, it's fine. It's a great formula. It does what it does. But the better answer to how these geometric series converge, if they converge, is that more generally, If a geometric series converges, it converges to the first term of the series divided by one minus the ratio. That's the way I like to think of it. So we could let's do some examples and then. We could totally derive the formula if you want to, but I don't, I don't know. It's it's not not it's not terrible, but I don't know if it's the best use of our time. You guys tell me. Do you want to do should we derive the formula? 
No, okay, that's fine. That's totally fine. So, for example, I've got lots of examples here. Do I have lots of examples? Oh, they're hiding over here. There they are. Cool. So, yeah. So, actually, let's go back to that the first example we had. The not the first example, but one of those examples um, for the sequence, which we determined to be a sub n equal to nine times two thirds to the n. Does the series from k equals one to infinity of that sequence, nine times two thirds to the n, does that converge or diverge? Well, it's all about the ratio. So let me ask you a different question. What is the ratio? Two thirds, whatever is raised to your nth power, that is your ratio. And since R is equal to two thirds, and that's between negative one and one, yes, we diverge. No, yes, we converge, sorry. Um, so yes, this converges, and it converges to the first term over one minus the ratio. So what's my first term? Well, it's what you get when you plug in your, uh, that should be a K, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, those should be Ks, not Ns. It's also standard to use N, but this is K. Okay. So let me ask you all, if you plug in your starting point of your indices, what do you get for your first term? Well, right, nine times two thirds over one minus two thirds. That's actually not that bad. If we if we think carefully here, nine times two thirds is six. One minus two thirds is one third. And if we multiply by the reciprocal, that's just 18. So what we're really saying here is that six plus four, I was writing out the terms of the sequence, we're writing them as a series now because I'm adding them up together. Six plus four plus, what was it, eight thirds, I think? Yeah plus eight thirds, plus 16 ninths, plus dot, dot, dot. That's adding up to 18. Just to show you a slightly different twist on this problem, what if I asked, I'm just going to ask it in the assumptive way, what does the sum from k equals three to infinity of the same sequence, what does that converge to? Well, this is the same as that, but what am I missing in this one that I had in this first one, the first two terms? So looking at what this one added up to and what the first two terms were, you could tell me it's going to converge to 18 minus what? Right, do you see that? No. Okay, so, so here's the difference. This one here, right? So my sequence is a sub n equals nine times two thirds to the n. So my first term is nine times two thirds, which is six. My second term is nine times two thirds squared, which is nine times four ninths, which is four. And each next term is just the previous term multiplied by two thirds. So the next term is eight thirds. The next term is, let's see, times two is 16, times three is nine, and so on and so forth. So when we're doing the sum from k equals one to infinity, we're starting at k equals one, so we're getting nine times two thirds, and then we're just adding up all the terms forever and ever and ever and ever. And the formula says that it adds up to this pattern here, where it's the first term, nine times two thirds, which is six, divided by one minus the ratio, which was one minus two thirds. So now this next question, the only difference between this and this is where I'm starting at. I'm starting here at k equals three. So my first term, if I plug in k equals three, my series is going to look like, I do think this is actually very valuable. By plugging k equals three, I get nine times two thirds cubed. And then my next term is nine times two thirds to the fourth and so on and so on and so on. But if I actually simplify those, nine times two thirds is nine times eight twenty sevenths, which is just eight thirds. 
And nine times two thirds to the fourth is nine times 16 over 81, which is just 16 over nine. So it's really the same as this, except what am I missing? The, right, the first two terms. So this, we can see that from this, it should add up to the same amount, except I have to subtract off the first two terms. Okay, but here's the really cool thing. You don't have to do this stupid thing every time where you're like, well, I know that if I start where I use, like to start and then I subtract off how many terms I don't have, I can get the actual number I'm looking for. But the real power of what I said over here is it works no matter where you start. So you could have said, oh, well, James, I'm just going to be, it's going to be the first term, which is nine times two thirds cubed over one minus my ratio. Nine times two thirds cubed, we said was eight thirds. Divided by one third and oh yeah, that's definitely eight. I can't emphasize enough how useful this is because people in other, like I've talked about geometric series a lot over the years and lots of professors kind of just say, well, there's this formula and then you can kind of manipulate it through these other things. But really it always works. If the geometric series converges, you can say it's just going to be whatever your first term is. You have to look at where you're starting, plug that into your formula to get the first term, and then divide that by one minus the ratio. It's super nice. Works all the time. It's kind of great. There's a reason it works. I mean, this kind of shows that it works, but you can actually derive the formula to see why it works in general, but we don't need to do that. I think you all believe me now that it totally, totally works. Cool. So let's look at a couple other examples, um, which are a little bit more interesting. Well, challenging. Let's say, uh, where you go? Oh, we should talk about that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Um, so let's look at another example. Let's say I had the sum from k equals one to infinity of negative four thirds to the n power times six. So does this series converge or diverge? Well, what's our ratio? And is negative four thirds bigger than one or less than negative one? It is, right? Negative four thirds is definitely more negative than negative one. So we can say that this series is going to diverge because the absolute value of our R is the absolute value of negative four thirds, which is four thirds, and that is bigger than one. So if the absolute value of your ratio is bigger than or equal to one, actually, the whole thing diverges. And what's happening here is that you're just adding up terms that are getting larger and larger and larger. Or I should say negatively large, positively large, negatively large, right? We're bouncing back and forth, right? If I wrote out terms here, my first term would be six times negative four thirds. Then we have six times negative four thirds squared, which is a bigger number. And then six times negative four thirds cubed, which is an even bigger negative number. So you're just getting larger and larger and larger, bouncing back and forth between positive and negative. And that actually brings up a really good point, which I kind of failed to say, which is super duper important. So yeah, let's look at this example. Let's say we have the sum from k equals one to infinity of Darn, I keep making the same mistake. I'm a, I, I, that, so I should have, I made a mistake here. It's not a big deal, but that should have been a K, not an N. So let's see, we want to say, yeah, I want to do that. So we have N over 2N plus 1. So does this converge or diverge? Well, let's look at what we've got. So if I just start plugging in numbers for K, it's, holy smokes, I did it again. I, I even just said it. <laughs> Good thing it's easy to turn N's into K's, I guess. Oh my God, I'm killing myself here. Sorry about that. These letters should match the index you're using down here. So if we start plugging in values for K. We're gonna say that this sum K equals one to infinity of K times two, sorry, over two K plus one is equal to, we're just going to start playing it. So you're going to get one over two plus one, which is one third 
plus two over five, plus three over seven, plus four over nine, plus five over 11, plus da, 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 forever and ever and ever. Now, let me ask you, the individual terms of the sequence, so the sequence A sub K equal to K over two K plus one. What does this sequence converge to? Well, the limit as K goes to infinity of your sequence is what fraction? Right, why not? Because we have the same power on top or the same, I should say the same degree on top as the bottom. So we're looking at that one as a coefficient over that two as a coefficient. So here's what that means. It means my numbers are getting really, really, really close to one half. So I'm adding up one third plus two fifths plus close to one half, 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 close to one half. When do I stop? When do I stop? Close to one half forever and ever and ever and ever. I'm adding up one half an infinite number of times. And what's one half added to one half added to one half an infinite number of times? Let's see, one half plus one half is one, plus one half is one and a half, plus one half is two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half. Do I get to stop? No. So we keep adding a half and I never get to stop. Infinity. Right. So here's what this means. This thing diverges. Now, it could have been, it could have been one half that this sequence converged to. It could have been one over two million. If I had one over two million plus one over two million plus one over two million plus one over two million an infinite number of times, I'm going to get infinitely large. I have to do it. I have to do it maybe a million more times than I did the one half to get to the same place. But I have forever. Right? This series goes on forever. The point being that if I'm adding up things that are not getting close to zero, the series will always diverge. This is actually a really important test. It's what's called the nth term test or sometimes called the test for divergence. So here's the, here's, and this is kind of a, yeah, this is a good result. So the nth term test, also known as the test for divergence. And it's really kind of probably better to call it the test for divergence because, and I want to point this out, it literally can only test for divergence. You can never use the test for divergence to show convergence. It is only testing for divergence. Here's what it says. It says that if the limit as n goes to infinity of your sequence, a sub n, is not zero, but probably converges to something. I mean, it could go to infinity. It could diverge in some other weird way. But a lot of times, the sequence will converge. Just like in this one, right here, the limit of our sequence, right? The sequence converged to one half. The series diverges. So if the sequence converges to not zero or diverges to something that's not zero. So I should actually, yeah. Then the series from n equals one to infinity of a sub n must diverge. There is no other choice because like we just saw, you're adding up some small number possibly, or maybe some large number, but whatever it is getting close to, you're adding that up an infinite number of times. So I just want to point out here, the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n might exist, probably exists, or might not. But if it's not zero, then the series diverges. On the other hand, just to be kind of full picture here, note that if the sequence converges to zero, then you don't know anything then the series could converge or could diverge.
basically what this really means is if the sequence has a limit of zero, if the sequence converges to zero, this means we have to do more work. To tell if the series diverges or converges. So sequence doesn't converge to zero, you're done. Series diverges. I just said, in the context of asking about the behavior of the series, if the sequence converges to not zero or diverges, you're done. The series diverges. If the sequence converges to zero, then you have to do more work. The prime examples of this, just so you are aware, and I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to have enough time to explain them right now, but I will just tell you the series from n equals one to infinity of one over n, probably the most famous divergent series we know. It's called the harmonic series, but it definitely is divergent. And I will point out just to stress, notably, the sequence one over n definitely converges to zero, right? You can take the limit of that and see that it goes to zero. On the other hand, this series from n equals one to infinity of one over n squared is convergent. Yet both of these series come from sequences that converge to zero. So both one over n converges to zero and one over n squared converges to zero. So I just want to emphasize really, really strongly here that if your sequence converges to zero, we know nothing about the series. The series could diverge, the series could converge. And there are lots of examples of both things happening. We'll talk more, uh, we got a minute or two. Um, I don't really want to do that though. No, let's just study. So next time we'll talk, well, actually next time we'll probably review for midterm. I think that's probably what we should do on Monday. Um, but next time we talk about sequences and series, We'll talk about the p-test and how you can tell something like that. Basically, oh, I, sh I should give you this handout. I'm going to give it to him already. Here's a handout that kind of details most of the tests we've seen in the class of sheet. Seeing if things converge or diverge. But so far, we've kind of talked about the, well, we just talked about the nth term test, which is really, when I'm looking to see if something converges or diverges, this is my go-to first thing I always do. It's kind of like with integration. Uh, before you do anything else, if it's not just easy, you should kind of check to see if you can do a U sub. Even if even if you don't think you really can, you still just kind of leave. is there a U sub there? Maybe, maybe. Same thing here. Whenever you're looking to see if a series is convergent or divergent, even though it might be super obvious, you should always check the sequence. Be like, does that sequence converge to zero? If not, you're done. If it does, okay, then move on. And most of the time, yeah, the sequence will converge to zero, and you have to do more work. But sometimes they'll give you a sneaky one that does where the sequence doesn't. You're like, oh great, I'm done. Um, and then the other thing we talked about today was the geometric series test. So we know, or we will know for sure, that the geometric series always converges if the ratio is less than one or bigger than negative one, and always diverges if the ratio is bigger than or equal to one and less than or equal to one. Oh, I, that's what I should do with this last minute I have here, is it mentioned that both this series, the sum from k equals one to infinity, of boringly one to the k. That's a geometric series, but it's super boring because the ratio is just one. So that definitely diverges because you're just adding one plus one plus one plus one plus one forever and ever and ever. But also interestingly, this series where the ratio is negative one also diverges. You start at negative one, negative one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. This also diverges. And here is, this is actually a more interesting situation. The reason it diverges is because my partial sums don't have a limit that converges to something. My first partial sum is what? What's my second partial sum? What's my third partial sum? What's my fourth partial sum? Right, so every other partial sum is negative one or zero. But if you want to take the limit as n goes to infinity of these partial sums, well, it's just bouncing back and forth between negative one, zero, and negative one, zero, and negative one, zero, and negative one, zero. That limit doesn't exist. 
because you're not getting close to one specific number no matter how far out you go. So even though this is, kind of feels like it could be negative one or zero, it doesn't diverge. So this also diverges. So that's why we're able to say, oh yeah, the geometric series from K equals one to infinity of A times R to the K converges if the absolute value of your ratio is strictly less than one and diverges if the absolute value of your ratio is greater than or equal to one. Okay, I'm done talking for real now. Have a lovely weekend. I'll see you all on Monday. We'll review for the exam.